Welcome back bike fans. Today we're looking at the brand new 2023 Marin Alpine Trail XR. This is a full suspension aluminum bike with 150 millimeters of travel in the rear, 160 millimeter travel fork, quite progressive angles meaning slack head tube, steep seat tube, relatively long reach designed around wide bars and a short stem. And this is a beast of a bike that falls somewhere in the zone that you could call between an aggressive trail bike and a short travel bike park bike. Today, like we always do in these videos, we're going to have a look at the specifications, the details of the bike. We'll talk about some of these things here like who does it suit, negatives, sizing, positives, upgrades, and a summary. If you're a bike geek and you like seeing this sort of stuff about bike and maybe getting a little bit more in-depth information, especially when it comes to Marin, Giant, Rocky Mountain, Marin, Niner, um, this might be the place for you. So maybe consider uh, giving a like, giving a like, uh, maybe I can speak English here, giving a like uh, or subscribe. And uh, we basically do this on piles of bikes that we carry in the store. So once again, this is a 2023 Marin Alpine Trail XR and we're about to get into a bunch of details and talking about some of those details and how they might matter to you. So the basic specs on this 2023 Marin Alpine Trail XR. Our shop Bike Bros is in Canada. The Canadian price on this bike is $44.99. In the United States this bike would be $35.99. This is the higher end of two aluminum Alpine Trails um, that Marin makes. The cheaper of the two is, let me see my notes here, $37.49 in Canada or $29.99 USD. Between the two bikes they actually are kind of different in their purpose, who they're going to suit, um, all that sort of stuff. So to start with on this one, like I said, 150 millimeter rear travel, 160 millimeter travel fork, one of the big things before we get into some of the details, this XR means that we're looking at on this new 2023 version, a coil rear shock and a coil fork. So we're looking at a Marzocchi Bomber CR. This thing is getting quite good reviews as far as giving a relatively high end coil shock performance while not being a super expensive shock. So makes sense to be on here. In this size large, they're using a 450 pound spring. I believe on size small and medium, they use a 350 pound spring. Now, don't get confused that that means that this is for a 450 pound or 350 pound rider. It basically, by the time the suspension works its way through all this stuff, you have a shock ratio, which then equals this to, I'm just gonna pull a number out of the air, say the equivalent of a spring that is meant for somebody in the 180 to 200 pound range. A similar thing happens in the fork. Instead of over on this side of the fork having an air adjust, what we have on there is just a preload um, which is adjusting the coil spring that's inside that fork leg. So, just as a general note, this, that is probably the two standout things on this bike that makes it um, quite unique in the bike world. Um, with a lot of different companies, you're seeing, say companies like Rocky Mountain with their Slayer, the use of a coil often goes hand in hand with bike park bikes. So that is because of its durability and the extreme plushness, smoothness off the top of the stroke. So that is a big thing to touch on with this bike and I'll go into a couple more things about it um, as we're uh, getting into some discussion later, but I just want to point that out to you. Um, on top of that pricing information uh, and those basics about the coil sprung stuff, which is very important about this bike, this is a 38.2 pound bike. And before you click out because you just think that this thing is a heavy beast, it, I would say, it's a fair weight for what this bike is doing. This bike, like I said, it's the bike that could be an aggressive trail bike. You're just hauling an extra five pounds, three pounds up a mountain, um, but it's still gonna work really well for that. And once you're into 
uh, bike park settings, that extra weight, you don't really care about it. You're just happy that you have that plushness of the coil suspension. So rear travel on this, 150 millimeters, and it is built around a single pivot rear suspension design. So that, that I just zoomed in on there, that is your main pivot. Your rear wheel arcs in a simple circular motion around that. Your suspension is activated with, this is um, just a link driven single pivot. So you've got a link above and ahead of the rear axle on the seat stay, not on the chain stay. So that's the difference between this being single pivot or being a horse link. Um, like a lot of other bikes that are out there, like Rocky Mountain, Specialized, especially any of their longer travel bikes at least. That transfers up to here. We then have a forged one piece rocker link, all with really nice hardware showing torque specs, it's aluminum, all that sort of stuff, so it looks good. Uh, just a nice fit and finish. And then that is driving your shock vertically there, and that is resulting in 150 millimeters of travel. One of the other things about this bike that I would say stands out is for being 150 millimeters, the chainstay length, so from um, your bottom bracket center there to your rear axle, it is on the short ends of things compared to a lot of bikes that would be bike parkish. The idea there is they're trying to make this thing as nimble, um, kind of fun to ride as possible. It'll be easier to pull into manuals, maybe easier to sort of wheelie drop off stuff or to just lift the front wheel off the ground essentially. So 430 millimeters there, that these days is getting to quite a short chain stay for being an aggressive bike. So that goes hand in hand, I think, with it being shorter travel. They're trying to give you a park bike, but a park bike that is gonna be for somebody who really likes doing creative stuff on their bikes. If you follow a lot of the Marin riders on Instagram, um, on YouTube, you'll tend to find that that fits pretty well with a lot of their attitudes. They aren't just people who do huge hucks or scream down mountains at top speeds. They're having fun, and that is exactly what Marin, what their logo or slogan is basically all about, is Marin is made for fun. So getting back to the specs, this thing, $4,500 bike in Canada with a proper XT derailleur, a 12-speed drivetrain with a 10 to 51 tooth range, and that is a Dior cassette. We have a KMC chain on there. XT rear derailleur, and I'll just go up to here just to show how mishmashy everything is, and SLX rear shifter. So some people complain about the mishmash because um, they think that companies are trying to fool you. Whatever. Um, XT is better than anything um, else that they would have put on here. I think people just get excited to see a high quality rear derailleur, and nobody denies that XT just works incredibly well. Uh, Dior cassettes, their performance is really good. They just happen to be on the heavier side of things, but the trade-off for that is that means that there's more steel rings, so they might last a little longer. So I think the, uh, the theme of what they've upgraded and what they chose not to upgrade makes sense for a bike that's just built to ride really well and be under somebody who is um, maybe going to yeah ride tons, be aggressive on it. Tire choice on here, um, I assume I mentioned this is a 29er, but if I didn't, it's 29er. 29 by 2.5, wide trail, Maxxis, Asagai tires with the double down casing on the rear here. So that is important to note that they're actually putting the kind of tires that suit the attitude of this bike. And once again, the tires are going to be contributing to the weight. Double down is not exactly a light tire but for the performance of the bike is awesome. Asagai is a super popular tire as well for aggressive riding, so very appropriate. They put double down on the rear. Once you go to the front, they go to XO Plus, which is the next lighter casing. Um, so I think that's a very practical move. That is within a lot of enduro racer kind of personal setups, that's common to do a more uh, heavy duty casing on the rear. 
The tires are, of course, set up that TR, tubeless ready. The tires aren't set up tubeless. They come from the factory, so that is a valve off an actual inner tube. But the rims are taped, the tires are ready. So if you bought this bike, wanted to set it up tubeless, which I would advise, um, you just have to buy some valves and some sealant and get them set up tubeless and you're good to go. The rims are a Marin branded rim, 30 millimeters wide. Um, I will not oversell these rims um, from our experience in the shop. The Marin rims aren't fantastic. Fortunately, everything else in this bike is a smoking good deal and the rims will probably last you just long enough that you can save up to actually get some awesome wheels which would then upgrade from these relatively basic Shimano hubs on here that don't have particularly um, tight engagement. Um, there's a fair amount of play between the engagement points there. So they're putting something on that'll get you by for the first few months and then once you've got enough dents that you can't get these things to seal properly, then hopefully you can afford to get some amazing, what I would call lifetime wheels, like some We Are Ones or something like that, that can go on this and your next five bikes because they're just so amazing. While we're at the back end of the bike, I'll just shine the camera through the spokes there. This bike, when you look at Marin online, they're saying that this bike is going to be coming with TRP slates. So far, the first couple of these that we've seen show up, which these just showed up a couple weeks ago, um, have come with these Shimano M420 four piston brakes. I think these are a little bit nicer feeling brakes maybe than the TRPs, probably similar in performance. They're not the best, but they're also, there's a few reports out there, people who are actually fans of the brakes. 180 millimeter rotor on the back, what goes hand in hand with those MT420 brakes is that they're the highest end brake that uh, Shimano makes while still using this relatively long brake lever. By the time you climb up into the 6000 series brake above this, which is sort of the no-name version of a Dior brake, you get the shorter lever and that is a sign that you actually have servo wave as a mechanism inside the uh, lever body there, which helps to get more power that makes a shorter lever possible. In this case, the hack around having a longer lever and still wanting to get good single finger braking is the fact that we just ride these uh, levers fairly far in on the handlebars. Does that make sense? Um, going back to things around the middle of the bike, we've got some FSA gradient cranks, a decent crank and a Pretty nice looking crank now, just their combination of some machining. I believe these are a combination of forged and machined with an alloy narrow wide 32 tooth chainring on here. So hopefully it isn't news to you that a narrow wide going with a uh, clutched rear derailleur, um, that basically gives you really good chain retention so that you're less likely to bounce your chain off because you've got good chain tension in the really bumpy stuff. But looking through the chain rings down there, that little thing behind the chain ring that you can see, and I can spot one right there, those are mounts, which basically mean that you can mount a chain guide on here. So if you ride this thing really aggressively, ever experience an issue with the chain bouncing off, um, you're already set up that it's going to be an easy job to put a good chain guide on there. Going up to the seat post, we're looking at a Transex dropper. Depending on the size of the frame, that'll be a 125 mil dropper in a small, 150 mil dropper in a medium and large, and then a 175 on an extra large. Um, while we're talking about that, reach on a hundred on the large 480 millimeters, which is becoming a very, very common length, I would say, on um, modern trail bikes. Um, so just so you know, 480 reach on a size large, if you want to compare that to other bikes that you know, usually if you know the dimensions of a large, then you can kind of work backwards. And unless a company does wacky stuff like Giant, um, the sizing usually jives pretty well from brand to brand if you can find out where large uh, fits. The Marin saddle, 
there seems to be about 30 different types of Marin saddles and uh, every couple months we seem to see different shaped ones coming on the bikes. They're okay, nothing to write home about. Um, you probably want to be cool and put a WTB volt on there because WTB saddles rule. We have pedals on this bike but they don't come with pedals. I think that was just one of the shop guys put them on because he wanted to feel out this bike in the store and just give it a pedal. Bottle mounts of course here, some good down tube protection just down at the bottom so with it having a little bit of this kind of bulbous thingy sticking out forward which is so common on bikes. Also so common on bikes now is having sort of a rock guard down there for anything especially that gets spat up off the front wheel turned over or anything like that. The cable routing relatively simple. These are um, rubber plugs that get pushed into little oval holes in the frame. This is your dropper, enters the frame here, comes out underneath um, over here on the other side if you can see where my finger is. Otherwise um, other cable routing is coming out down there for your uh, rear derailleur. So um, other things to think about. Headsets are not particularly long on these bikes so you tend to not have an extremely high stack being that sort of if you do a vertical measurement from your center of your cranks up to how tall your handlebars are. These tend to not be very high stack. They have been generous giving us um, maybe a full three centimeters of headset spacers which is sort of the max recommended. Um, but just a thing to keep in mind if you are on a large side for these bikes that you might be thinking about getting uh, bars with higher rise. Um, with bars in mind, these are some of the first of the new Marin branded but aftermarket quality handlebars. They're 800 mils wide, I believe, 20 millimeters rise, 35 mil clamp and they are held onto the bike with this brand new design Marin CNC 35 mil stem. So it's nice to see when a company puts their own branded stuff on and that stuff is actually of proper aftermarket quality, not just a way that a company can save money by putting junk on there. Um, the Marins, yeah, these bars and stem, we're gonna be carrying these as stuff to sell because Everybody who's tried them really likes the uh, the sort of rise and sweep of the bars and that stem looks every bit as sexy as something like a race face turbine stem. So um, those are a whole bunch of the details. Uh, I am now going to, oh, I should say the brakes, 180 millimeter rotor on the back. Pretty sure that there are resin brake pads in there. The rotors are not resin specific, so you would be able to upgrade those uh, brakes to metallic pads if you needed more power. So that's kind of nice to see. Um, it is a 203 millimeter rotor on the front. They're held on here, they're center locked, not six bolt. And once again, um, not resin specific, so you would be able to upgrade brake pads and not be forced into upgrading the rotor. So, um, I'll just show you these grips. Um, I suspect these grips are actually going to be changing because they say that they're a Marin branded lock-on that's supposed to be spec'd on here, uh, but these aren't. They're still a lock-on, but they're not the uh, Marin branded ones that are once again aftermarket quality, but at least lock-on, it actually, these have a pretty nice feel to them. Uh, so, next we get into, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that suspension stuff and the goods and bads of coil sprung suspension. So I'm going to admit that I'm not a huge fan of coil suspension myself. I love the adjustability of air, but that doesn't mean it's bad. We have big fans of coil suspension in our shop and it's because me and some of those other staff we ride our bikes differently, use them differently. Um, and so I think there's some discussion to be had because I think for a lot of people, the appeal of coil is just that it's cool. It is cool, but it's cool for the person who is actually getting the 
performance out of it that is actually a benefit rather than either being um, unnoticed or being a little bit of a detriment. So here's your Coles notes on coil suspension. Your, as I mentioned before, the bike is coming with a certain poundage of um, spring strength. Think of that as the equivalent of what your PSI in your shock is. This is going to be really, really appropriate for somebody within a sort of 20 to 30 pound weight range. And they're gonna be looking at average rider weight, which is why earlier I sort of mentioned the 180 to 200 pound weight, which is what I imagine they're thinking somebody on a size large would be. So disadvantage number one is the fact that if you're outside of that weight range, instead of just adjusting your air pressure, you are going shopping for a shock of say 350, 400, or 475, um, depending on what the increments are that Fox is doing in this, you're basically shopping for a new spring to um, adjust the bike so that there's a couple things, both that you're getting the amount of sag that's correct, but I would say when you start thinking about coil, because it's a little bit harder to measure sag, the most common sign that people um, will take away to decide if they need a, especially a heavier coil, is if they feel bottom outs too often. So that is your one downside, is for adjustments, you're forced into replacing the coil, and you also can't do fine adjustments. Um, so if you're a little bit of a niggly person on fine adjustments, you don't get to do it with pressure, in this case, we are at least fortunate enough that in this uh, Bomber CR, that C stands for compression and R for rebound. So compression is that, rebound is that. Um, you do at least get some ways to sort of try to adjust um, that finer adjustment, but just keep that in mind. Nice thing is when you see that piggyback on here, at least that means that we do have some extra hydraulic fluid, which is what is controlling your uh, compression. And by having a piggyback means that at least there's enough fluid in there that you should be able to do a longer descent um, and not have a drastically different compression feel between the top of a long descent and the bottom, which is what can happen if you don't have enough, uh, basically hydraulic fluid in your system. Now, one thing people get confused about is they see this ring at the top of your shock and they think they're gonna be able to adjust their suspension with that thing. That thing does adjust preload, so it does adjust how easily your travel will start into its travel, but it doesn't make any difference as to how much force it's gonna to take to bottom out your spring. So keep that in mind. That is probably one of the most common errors people make is they think, oh, I'm just gonna, this will be the equivalent of going with a heavier spring, just winding this thing down and making it uh, firmer. Yes, it's firmer off the top. No, it doesn't stop you from bottoming out with the exact same amount of force. So my thinking in general to get the most out of a coil spring is to just wind your preload down enough that you don't basically have a loose coil here. And then at least you're gonna get the big benefit, which is gonna be that amazing plushness and being able to use a lot of your travel maybe a little bit more effectively than what you would out of a, uh, an air spring in there. When people get excited about coil springs, it is that plushness and also the fact that another um, sort of characteristic of coil springs is that it's a linear spring. So that means that uh, going through your first inch and going through your second inch of travel takes the same amount of force as opposed to on an air spring to go through your first inch of travel or whatever, it is going to take quite a bit more force to then go through the second inch of travel. So that's something to keep in mind. You also have, just to keep it confusing, within frame designs, you have some suspension designs that are gonna be more progressive or more linear and that is basically all of these, um, the mechanical system here that's driving your shock um, can be doing that same sort of thing. It can make 
um, the suspension ramp up being basically more resistance as you get further into the travel or be quite linear. And so a linear frame, you typically can't ride it with a linear shock because it means you're just going to blast through your travel um, too easily. Um, and just like a, an extremely progressive frame with a air shock in many cases can just feel too rampy, like you just can't get to the end of the stroke. Um, so there is some magic and the reason that they can use this exact same frame that's used on the Alpine Trail 7 with a coil or with air is because I would call it a mid-progressive. Just a, enough progressivity that your coil spring works, but not too much for your air spring to work. So how does that make any sense to that? Hopefully let me know if I've improved the understanding of coil springs or not. All of those concepts we just talked about on there, it's nice and visual because we've got a coil, happen in your fork as well. So we have those same things. You have incredible plushness, um, ground hugging, but if you happen to be heavier or lighter, you are then taking off this top cap and you're replacing the spring that's inside there. So those are the downsides. The upsides are that incredible plushness the coils tend to be a tad more robust as well. You just don't have air um, being held in by a rubber seal that at some point, if it gets dirty or whatever, you're gonna uh, damage the seal and have air escaping. So coils, simple, great ground hugging kind of a feel and super robust. So I think that that covers that side of things. Who does this suit? That's my next little piece of paper. Do you like how highly sophisticated I am with this? Man, high tech stuff, hey? Pen, paper, I can use it all. Um, who does this suit? This is for somebody who likes bike park stuff or likes shuttling. Um, maybe they don't do it all the time and probably don't do it all the time. So you like bike parks, you like shuttling, but you also want something that you can actually self propel and go for a trail ride. This is like sitting on that border. It's a half a trail bike, half a slope, um, or a bike park bike. Um, these do pedal quite efficiently, partially due to it's a good efficient suspension design, even though it's simple. And that 78 degree seat tube angle means that you're sitting in the right position to get power to the pedals and to keep some weight on that extremely slack 63 and a half degree head tube angle to stop your front wheel from getting too excessively light on climbs. On descents, that's when this thing is going to come alive. Um, you got super slack head tube angle, enough suspension um, to basically help you out. But I wouldn't consider this a super enduro bike. Uh, enduro these days, both the courses for enduro potentially can just um, basically be too much for a bike like this. So this, you're buying it because it's fun. Um, you're not riding the gnarliest of stuff. You can still ride really steep. You can still do stunts. You can still ride fast, but if it really gets mega chunky and you need lots of travel, there's no way around a need for a lot of travel. So does that make sense for who does this suit? Negatives. I'm going to have to think about this. Um, Brakes would probably be the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, but we'll have half the people out there who don't just get wrapped up in needing better because other people say they're better, actually say, eh, brakes are pretty good. Um, to be truly honest about the whole thing, I would say the negatives on a lot of the Marins are the rims. They just aren't the toughest things in the world. But the price that you pay for the bike, I think is fair. And I actually like Marin putting these cheap wheels on there because nothing frustrates me more on bikes than, than feeling like you've paid for sort of upgraded wheels, but they're an aftermarket brand with kind of garbage quality ones. Um, so then you feel like an idiot if you're replacing them with something higher end. I would rather just have, give me the cheap wheels, um, leave me a few hundred bucks already um, in my bank account that helps me to save up to have some truly um, high-end wheels, like I mentioned earlier, the We Are Ones, which we're big fans of. Um, what else? The bars, stem, really nice. Dropper, works. Tires, awesome. 
Um, can't complain about the cranks, they work. Um, I think maybe I've heard some people complaining about creaking, but it, that seems to maybe be going away. Those talks on some of the FSA cranks. So that stuff is good. Drive train, good, solid. The price, very respectable for the quality of bike. Um, this is my note sheet. This is what I'm looking at when I'm talking. Uh, positive of, of this bike. The value, the value is huge. Um, 4,500 bucks and getting actual quality drivetrain and suspension means those are really hard things to replace. And if they're too cheap off the, uh, off the go, that detracts from your fun. Um, with the downside being the rims, you can just keep on riding this bike until you've dented those rims so much that you can't hold air in your tubeless system and move on. So I think the spec for the price is killer. The fact that it's got the coil sprung stuff on here, it is, it puts it in a niche. For a lot of people, those are super desirable things that are hard to get. So that is a huge positive. Uh, things like the Marin branded stuff, the bars and stem on here, I think are really um, good highlights as much as they're overlooked on a lot of these bikes. Um, super good. And then geometry, the 78 degree seat tube angle, 63 and a half head tube angle, 480 reach with 430 mil chain stays. This thing is slack enough to give you a pile of confidence, but also rides like quite a good bike when you need to meander through stuff that isn't just hauling ass downhill. So that's a bunch of big positives, I would say. Um, spec, value, geometry, um, for that money, absolutely killer. Upgrades, um, the first upgrade I would do is I would be setting this thing up tubeless. So you'd be into it for say a hundred bucks, some valves, some sealant, maybe some shop time to get us to do it with our compressor. Um, and you're gonna be out there having piles of fun. If you're lucky, you might not even, like I'm, I'm not saying these rims are going to die on you. I'm saying if you ride really aggressively, um, then, and with really soft tires, you can dent these rims. But you might end up having this bike for months and months and riding hard and just have a bike that you can truly enjoy and not have anything that is ruining your ride. So in summary, if you have 4,500 bucks, you gonna hit the chairlift, gonna hit some shuttles, gonna hit the local trails, you want something that does a bit of everything, you like maybe throwing shapes off jumps, um, while also going for trail rides, this is an awesome all around beast of a bike. And at 4,500 bucks, I'm gonna say if you go shopping in a bike shop, uh, I would be quite surprised if you could find something that was a better deal and even in the direct to consumer, this is a hard bike to beat. So, what do you think? Marin, Alpine Trail, XR? Um, fire me questions. I try to answer questions um, as often as possible. They're starting to come in with the number of videos that we have out there now. Um, it's starting to get a little bit hard to keep up with the questions, but if you look in the comments section, um, I'm answering probably half the questions at least. Um, and remember, I'm a bike shop owner. I've got uh, a bike shop to run, but I do enjoy this, and I really like just passing along information, um, giving people some actual um, experience-based knowledge about bikes. I've been at this in the bike shop world. I am, I think over 30 years in bike shops now. Um, and I'm not just a bike shop guy, but an actual bike rider. And I'm still absolutely obsessed by bikes. Love them. Nothing makes me happier than bikes. So until next time, thanks for watching. Press that thumbs up button, press the ding dong. I don't know, press any buttons you want. Um, we'll talk to you later. Thanks for checking this out.